Well, first of all, like Bob Dole, you've been in both the House and the Senate, which is better. <laughs> oh, the Senate is better, I think, in many respects. It's a smaller institution. You're given more latitude to be involved in the legislative process, and uh, if you work hard and, uh, and keep your focus, there's a lot you can do. But I think in large measure, because you have longer terms and smaller numbers, it uh, accommodates those who are real interested in the legislative process. The trajectory of your career, uh, in many ways, is similar to his. Um, presumably, when you first went to Congress, as opposed to when you left, um, the role of television, um, fundraising, I mean, what kinds of changes took place during that period that, in some ways, redefined the job? Well, I think the media probably had more to do with, with uh, redefining how it functions as anything. I think the two big consequential effects environmentally on the legislative process were the airplane and the television. The airplane because it accommodated members uh, in a way that they've never had the opportunity to be accommodated before to get back to their states and districts. And that changed the dynamics here in town a lot. You, you really began to reduce the level of social interaction and the kind of uh, bonding that occurred among legislators when they were really forced to stay in town. The second, the media, allowed for a scrutiny and a uh, sort of an intrusive uh, view of the process that ultimately, in my view, uh, exacerbated rather than uh, enhanced the process because in many respects it created an opportunity for dialogue not one-on-one -on -one, but through the media and that's really a, a big part of what what happens now. Uh, leaders would walk out of their office and face a bank of cameras and in some ways direct their comments to the leader down the hall through the camera and that happened all too frequently. Not to mention the extraordinary power of a 30-second commercial and the fear of most legislators to be victimized or to be affected in some way by the 30-second attack ad that they knew would be coming on virtually everything they did. So it had an effect, in my view, on the courage, uh, if not courage, at least the the flip side, the temerity of members to to look at issues uh, in a more thoughtful way. Well, that, that, that's interesting because it also raises this question. Um, Bob Dole is a classic pragmatist, a get things done kind of conservative, and, and it would seem that that's out of fashion. That that uh, that the rise of the twenty four seven news cycle, the internet, um, ideologically defined cable networks driving a lot of the political conversation. Pragmatists don't fare very well. That's true. In, the, in that arena, do they? No, pragmatists on either side. I, mean, I think that, I think we've seen to a certain extent an erosion of the middle because of a number of factors, the media being a big part of it, uh, but there is a uh, a tendency now to play to your base a lot more and the bases are more extreme uh, by their very nature and so it's hard to find the pragmatists willing to face the base maybe upset them a little to accomplish something for the larger good is there a difference at least in degree there between the house and the senate in that clearly house districts tend to be drawn along lines that reinforce that quality that the parties tend to to, uh, to uh, enshrine their bases in congressional districts where when you're running statewide at least in theory you have to you have to appeal to a broader audience well I think I think that it depends on the state those that are prominently Republican or Democratic um, have bases that are every bit as demanding statewide as they are within their districts. I would look at, say, perhaps uh, 
um, maybe a Rhode Island and a Utah are two good examples where you've got a pretty strong Democratic base in one, a strong Republican base in the other, and that base is statewide. So I think your point is well taken. I think by and large it's probably more of an issue among members of the House, but unfortunately it's all too prominent uh, a challenge in the Senate now as well. Uh, tell me about your first contact with Bob Dole. Well, I, I, I'd have to say I, I don't recall my first contact. I remember coming to the Senate and almost immediately uh, developing a friendship and a relationship in part because of his work on agriculture. Also, I was a member of the Finance Committee and he was a very prominent member of the Finance Committee as well. So we shared committees together and we shared uh, the same uh, the same uh, uh, geographic proximity. I, my wife is from Kansas and uh, was Miss Kansas and got to know Bob Dole probably before I did and had a very, very high regard for, for him based on her experiences way back when. So the combination of my wife's experiences and mine on the committees uh, led us to have a, a friendship that uh, meant a lot to me. Um, I remember when Bob and Elizabeth uh, celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary, they invited a few senators to come to the reception and uh, they were kind enough to invite Lyndon and me. And it, I thought, uh, was a f reflection of the kind of friendship that we had that uh, lasts to, uh, to this day. How much is he shaped by Russell, Kansas? And, and, and what is that what does that mean in terms of the kind of senator, the kind of leader he is? Well, I, I don't think he's ever very far away from Russell, Kansas. I think the values that he acquired growing up and the extraordinary sense of community that he has with Russell today is still very much in evidence. He talks about it in many of his speeches as I uh, appear with him on stages uh, around the country. He, uh, in personal conversation, will regale us with stories of his time uh, in Russell. So it means a lot to him, I think, as one degree of the identity that he uh, treasures and um, and I can understand that connection. I have one myself with my hometown of Aberdeen, South Dakota. So it's it's uh, a big part of his persona and his character. Do you think there's a little bit of populism in that background? Oh, I don't think there's any doubt. When you come from the Great Plains, there is a populist. Uh, uh, element to your philosophical views and uh, to the direction of the outlook you have. Um, maybe more evident in some than others, but clearly a different attitude or a different experience, life experience, than you'd probably have on either coast. 1994 is uh, not a great year for, uh, for, the, for the Democrats, um, but it's a pretty good year for you. Um, tell us about how you became minority leader, how you became leader. Well, in 94, um, I was, w w George Mitchell was my predecessor and uh, a very uh, close friend and a mentor. He made the decision not to run for re-election. And so it was uh, clearly uh, going to be a competitive uh, opportunity. I chose early to run after uh, confiding in a few of, uh, with a few of my colleagues. Um, Jim Sasser was my original opponent, and uh, Jim Sasser was from Tennessee, and and uh, so it was uh, it was a, a Sasser Dashiell race all the way up until the election, and then the election occurred, and uh, Sasser was defeated by Bill Frist. Un somewhat unexpectedly, and uh, so Chris Dodd uh, then uh, became, in a sense, a surrogate for Chris uh, for for Jim Sasser, but nonetheless a very uh, uh, highly regarded member of the caucus. 
And I think the concern among many in our caucus was whether someone with such limited experience as I had, I had only been elected in, in um, 86, um, so this was six years later, and, and not really uh, as senior as most leaders had been in the past. So uh, those who were more senior were concerned about, uh, about that and chose to support Chris uh, in part for that reason, other, obviously other reasons as well. He's, as I said, he was highly regarded. I ended up winning, and, and of course we were running for majority leader up until the election, and then we lost the majority uh, because, as you've correctly noted, it was a bad year for Democrats. And um, so overnight he became a candidate for minority leader rather than majority leader, but certainly Democratic leader. And uh, to make a long story short, I won by one vote. And uh, so I became the leader in December of, of 1994. And uh, Bob Dole at the time was the Republican leader. And overnight he became the majority leader. Chris said that's exactly 10 years after he was uh, elected for, for Republican leader. Um, and what kind of initial contact uh, did the two of you have um, following your election? Well, I remember for some reason a reception um, a couple of nights after the election, and it was at the Corcoran Art Gallery, very uh, elaborate reception and dinner. I think, I, uh, now that I think about it, it was a reception and dinner, and for some reason I remember in typical Bob Dole fashion, uh, his observation uh, cracking that as a result of the leader election, everybody in the Great Plains, all farmers in the Great Plains were now buying new pickups. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I think there was somewhat, uh, I, I, I recall some of the stories at the time where agriculture was thinking, well, this is going to be pretty good for us. This is the first time uh, both leaders came from agricultural states. Um, and so we were perceived to be a good team from that perspective. But it was right from the beginning, in part because of our previous relationship, that he reached out to me and uh, made me feel very comfortable. And, and uh, we began working together. Obviously we had many issues that divided us. The Clinton administration of course uh, had only been in office for two years and had had a rough two years with whitewater investigations and other matters of political import that uh, seemed to undermine the president's ability to get started. He had just come off a, uh, a, a somewhat of a debacle with the health care debate in the two years prior. Uh, he had passed NAFTA, which was a good thing, uh, but, uh, but so with somewhat of a shaky beginning in a new administration and the Republicans taking over with not a significant majority, but nonetheless a majority, uh, it was a precarious way to get started in leadership. Was there any sense of shell shock at all? I mean, uh, let's face it, it's been a long time since Republicans had controlled one, let alone both houses. Um, did, did it take it all, uh, take, did it take any time to sort of recover from that initial oh, shock? Or Absolutely, it took a long time. And I, I can recall after my election, I, I, I debated a lot about uh, with my, you know, just uh, how was I going to convince my colleagues? Here you've got a guy who really hasn't been around that long, just one election by one vote, just after having lost the majority, uh, you know, how, what, what were we going to do, and uh, how, were, what was the plan, and how much expectation was there that we could, we could get it back, say, in '96, um, given the president's precarious start, up for re-election in '96. We thought this was not going to be. Uh, an easy ride for any of us. Uh, so I, 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 I decided that I thought the best policy was was full candor and uh, I said I'm not sure I have the answers today but I think we need to come together and find them and work together to see if we can work our way out of this mess and uh, over time I guess you could say we we made an effort to do that. You had a little bit of help from the Republicans didn't you? I mean the fact is the uh, 
the whole Gingrich Dole relationship must have been pretty uh, fraught. Um, uh, certainly, the government shutdown came along, which was, I think, most people agree, brilliantly played by the White House and uh, mishandled by Republicans in Congress. Um, what are your recollections of that? And, and in particular, Dole must have been climbing a wall during during that period. Well, he made his views known to me and to others. Um, all the way along and it was as we had been talking earlier about pragmatism versus ideological fervor this was probably the probably the best early indication of the conflict within the Republican ranks between pragmatic somewhat moderate conservatives and the ideological firebrand uh, conservatives that had just taken over the house Newt Gingrich had a different style and a different tone and uh, as a result there were very obvious elements of real friction between House and Senate Republican leaders. Uh, during the shutdown we were um, we used to have to come to the Oval Office and uh, and we would actually I mean for negotiations directly with the president, the vice president and um, Leon Panetta uh, was in the room and uh, and the four leaders and night after night we reserve the negotiations we do our work during the day and then everybody would come down there at night and I recall at one point uh, Senator Dole and uh, Speaker Gingrich having a clear uh, uh, dispute about the about how to respond to what we were working on at the time and uh, and whispered something to each other and then s just left and um, indicated to us that they didn't know how long it would be before they came back but they did want to come back so uh, there we were in the Oval Office and uh, the president said well you want to just watch a movie so we watched a movie and he made popcorn and um, waiting for our colleagues to come back as the government was shut down. And did they come back? And because there were very, it was, it was just the, uh, the essential workers, there weren't many people to make popcorn for us, so the president made it himself. And they did come back later on that night. They had uh, reached agreement between themselves? Exactly. Uh, the <clears throat> it's funny, I think you said at one point, that you talked about, I mean, I think right after you became minority leader and he came to visit you in your office and you wondered whether it was some sort of psychological trick that was being played uh, and you concluded that wasn't the case but you also concluded that uh, under those circumstances he determined when the meeting ended which leads me to something Danny Rosankowski told me that right about the time of the government shutdown the president called him and said tell me something about Bob Dole that I don't know in fact try to Get an get an advantage in the in the negotiations, and Rostenkowski went on saying all sorts of nice things. But he said, "But I tell you, he's the most impatient guy in Washington." <laughs> and he says, "There are times when he'll give you whatever you want just to get out of the room." Um, presumably, that's an exaggeration. But is that is that a quality that you you've noticed? Or? Yeah, no, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, while he is a pragmatic, generally moderate person on a philosophical scale his his willingness to subject himself to long periods of of uh, bull sessions are not ones that he relishes and uh, he has a, a great impatience with with uh, a lot of the the more deliberative aspects of the work that we're subjected to sometimes yeah no patience and uh, but a great deal of of humor through most of it. I mean he has uh, sort of two personalities. He has a dark side and he has a very humorous, light and lively, full of uh, you know just an amazing ability to to um, in, a, in, a, in a word or in a phrase sort of sum up the moment with uh, with a touch of humor or with a lot of humor sometimes and uh, but then on the other hand he can be very uh, he can be uh, 
a very frustrated and uh, somewhat angry person who can direct that anger and and uh, make it very clear uh, what his feelings are about a given issue. You've been minority leader, you've been majority leader, he's been both of those. Um, there is a school of thought that says, you know, if you don't particularly care about getting things done, being minority leader is actually more fun than being majority leader. Uh, I'm not sure about fun, but which, what, what's attractive about each position and what's, what's less so? Well, I think it depends a little bit on how many people constitute your majority. Because if you've got a comfortable majority, I would say it's always more fun being in the majority uh, because you really can work your will and uh, you know with a little help from Republicans I mean Mike Mansfield in many respects had had his own issues within his caucus because of the South and the difficulties that he had in keeping um, some degree of unity and cohesion uh, same with Lyndon Johnson but when you've got 67 senators as they had it's a little different story than if you had 51 like I had being in the majority and Bob Dole has had similar majorities and minorities but I think that uh, so that it starts with that but the majority leader clearly is the 600 pound gorilla when it comes to your ability to set the agenda your ability to orchestrate uh, a legislative response to a president who is not of your party which is what my circumstances were you are sort of the alternative voice you are the person to respond to uh, the president uh, uh, um, when when you are the the majority leader and and he's the uh, the, the leader of the Republican um, ranks and so so it starts with that it's just a, a realization that both from a legislative as well as a political point of view you're in a very commanding position to at least to articulate to the country uh, what um, what you like and what you don't like um, the minority position if you are a 49 vote caucus is in a relatively strong position you have the ability to express yourself with regard to the agenda even though you don't set it and so it's very important for the majority leader to deal with you fairly frequently and in, in all of my years uh, we were in that proximity of 51 52 votes and so uh, it was uh, a far more uh, uh, far more challenging partnership for the two leaders I remember Trent Lott and I had to work through what we called the power sharing agreement because we were at a point where we were at 50 50 for a while I even debated how would we deal with managing the Senate with 50 50 uh, relationships in our caucuses so um, it's a uh, it's probably a little more fun at least a little less responsibility and a little more opportunity to uh, to be critical where you want to be uh, when you're in the minority uh, but when you've got that partnership um, there is a responsibility that comes with it so it's it's a little bit different I think than when it was what it was like in the 60s and and early 70s when one party had two-thirds of the vote yeah, you know, we read these stories about Lyndon Johnson's legendary mastery of the Senate. Um, what is it that's changed about the Senate? Is it just the numbers uh, that seems to preclude that kind of command? Or was LBJ just a, a unique figure? Yeah. Well, LBJ, if you read the biographies of LBJ, his influence was waning at the end of his his uh, six years he didn't have the same power he had during the during his heyday because there were a lot of young senators that were uh, just not going to take it anymore and they were going to assert themselves and that's you had the Frank churches at the time and the people that uh, that really began to uh, 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 Fred uh, um, there's a uh, can't think of his name from Oklahoma Fred, uh, Fred Harris Harris right 
Um, but a number of uh, a number of young Turks were rising up. I'll never forget the famous story that when he became vice president, he decided he still wanted to have the opportunity to lead the caucus and uh, and to be chairman of the caucus, even though he was going to be vice president, because technically he's still a member of the Senate. And um, no one really wanted to uh, tell him no. Um, and so he just assumed that it was all a done deal and he came to the caucus and they rolled him. Mm. And he was so embarrassed he didn't come back for an entire year after being rolled as the as a vice president. So he learned too that there were limits to power um, that I think are becoming much more prominent. What's happened I think is that to a large extent senators over time became far more independent, far more assertive, and far more uh, unwilling to be dictated to. And that in part is, came as a result of uh, reforms in the, in the, in the caucus. It, reform is a, sometimes a word that I, I'm reluctant to use because change is more, if, if reformers are always viewed as a good thing, sure. um, in many cases I'm not sure these reforms are always the best thing. But nonetheless, changes in the Senate that gave more independence and more uh, opportunities for uh, for a freedom of movement and freedom of expression in the Senate than it used to be. It used to be you, a senator was uh, w was rarely um, heard from in his first year, uh, but that's changed as well. Now senators are very vocal in their very first year in office, and uh, that's probably a good thing. But uh, nonetheless, I think things have changed internally and externally to bring about a difference. I'll never forget George Mitchell's advice to me as he was leaving the office uh, the very first day. He said, uh, um, that in order to be successful in this job you have to learn how to grovel and I don't know whether I know he was mostly joking but there is some truth to that <laughs> That's well put. did he give you any advice about dealing with Dole well his advice was that Bob Dole will do two things very effectively one he will always be straight with you you never have to worry about being surprised by Bob Dole. And secondly, um, if you have to take him on, um, uh, it's, it's not going to be a pleasant experience. And uh, I remember George sharing that with me uh, the first couple of days we were together after I got elected. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, I think that uh, that it just meant that it's never easy if 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 Bob is going to be your opponent it's never easy um, you can't just assume even if you're in the majority uh, that uh, that you're going to to come out on top that he had a very effective way of organizing his people and sometimes some of yours do you have a sense of uh, the Dole Clinton relationship well, I think it went through phases. Uh, the first phase was not a very good one. Um, I suspect that even though he was the majority leader, um, there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of investigative efforts underway in the Senate and in the House at the time. And uh, I remember many, many conversations with the President where he expressed himself about his, and he, he felt that Bob Dole was, was responsible. Uh, because it was fairly clear from almost the, the day Bob became majority leader that he was going to run for president. Mm -hmm. So it was Clinton's view that that experience uh, was was going to be affected dramatically by uh, by Bob's political ambition. Um, so then when he stepped down from his leadership role and became a candidate, in some ways, it reduced the tension between the two because um, it wasn't viewed any longer as an official uh, capacity. And uh, but things didn't change. Of course, we went all the way up through impeachment. So, um, uh, but Bob was uh, was was I think really quick after the election to send signals to the president that uh, you know the election's over and. Uh, given his humor um, in particular. He cut through whatever political uh, 
issues there were and uh, they developed a pretty good friendship after that and uh, I would say are reasonably good friends today. In fact, in some ways I wonder if there wasn't more tension between Dole and the emerging right wing of his own party, the cultural right. I mean, he'd obviously been an economic conservative, but also what I call a sort of, a, it's none of your business conservative. You know, leave me alone conservative. Right. And now there was this, obviously this rise of the, of the religious right in particular within his party. And I also said that he was never, he was never totally comfortable with that. And uh, he had that weighing on him throughout that period. He did. I think this was a tough time because the Republican Party was going through a fairly consequential transition and you still had elements of, uh, of the pragmatist uh, faction very much a part of, of, of the caucus in the Senate, but they had lost everything on the House side. Bob Michael had lost his election and, and as a result uh, there was and, uh, and I can't recall, there was Ed Madigan was another pragmatist who lost, and uh, the firebrands took over. And I think Trent Lott was viewed somewhat as sort of a transitional figure in that regard, not necessarily a pragmatist, but not quite as ideological, someone who respected the institution, but he beat Alan Simpson by one vote, who was viewed as a pragmatist. And so that transition was taking root, and uh, and then I think it ultimately did take root with, a, with a much more of an ideological uh, person in Bill Frist. So um, that transition took a while and Bob Dole was right there during that period of time. Did he discuss at all with you his, uh, his plans to leave the Senate? He didn't. Uh, uh, I'd have to, I don't recall. Were you surprised uh, I, when you first heard it? or? Uh, However, you first heard. Everybody kind of anticipated. I mean, it wasn't a. It was a poorly held secret. Mm. Um, so, I don't recall how early in our relationship as leaders it became clear to me that he was running. But it did mean a lot to me that on a couple of occasions uh, he took me in his confidence about his plans, and then. Uh, there was, I'll never forget, uh, the day he made his final speech, he uh, also had a somewhat of a farewell reception on the uh, ninth floor of the Hart Building. And uh, he asked if I would come over and speak at this farewell reception. Uh, and of course, here you have the likely uh, Republican nominee for president, um, leaving the Senate and uh, many of us who uh, worked with him uh, in a sense wishing him well and uh, speaking very very fondly of him and of uh, our relationships with him at this reception. Um, so I was uh, I was uh, somewhat moved that uh, that he would ask uh, ask me to do that and uh, was uh, I, rem I, I still remember it quite vividly. A couple of process questions. How did he use staff? Well, he's all three of the leaders on the Republican side that I've worked with had totally different approaches to leadership and staff. I think Bob was by far, of the three, the most inclusive of staff. And, and in some ways, I have to say, I guess I'd... I'd I'd probably assert even had the most professional and impressive staff. Um, people that had been with him a long time, people who knew him. We'd come in um, and sit at a, one of our conference tables, mostly, as you noted, uh, they'd, he'd come over to my office about at least once a week, and he would bring his staff with him, and I would have my staff with him, and it would almost be like a, a formal uh, uh, you know, two foreign leaders meeting each other with uh, interpreters and staff on either side. And, uh, but we would sit down and we'd have paper and we'd walk through the paper. Staff would feel free to interject and uh, correct in some cases. Uh, but it was respectful and, uh, and very much a part of a, sort of a team feel uh, that he 
created as as uh, part of his leadership style. I actually learned from that myself and uh, always felt much more uh, much closer in style in that regard to Bob Dole than my other two predecessors who preferred, or I should say his two successors, I should say, who uh, were not as comfortable with staff and were not as, uh, and, and preferred in some cases much more one-on-one -on -one, um, related uh, 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 communication. Did you ever see him lose his temper? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. What what would make him lose his temper? Is there... Oh, I think in many time many cases it was it was what he viewed to be an unreasonable position or unreasonable demand or request or or just circumstances that neither of us could really control but were nonetheless there and we had to confront and uh, you know, oftentimes unfair criticism um, by somebody in my caucus or, you know, it, it really didn't, I, I, you know, I, there wasn't any one thing. It was just, but I have to say, I, I certainly wouldn't want to give the impression that it was a frequent occurrence. It wasn't. Um, oftentimes you could tell he was angry, but he would not, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be a, an outburst. It was just clear from the body language that he was not happy. But um, but sometimes there was an outburst. Yeah. Well, what do you think the role of Elizabeth is? I mean, you know, there, there was a, a school of thought that I thought maybe a little bit oversimplified that uh, that she somehow was responsible, largely responsible for the new Bob Dole, you know, for softening Bob Dole, for rubbing some of the rough edges off of Bob Dole and all this. And uh, of course, then there's also the argument that he was given responsibility, you know, after having been in the minority all those years and an opportunity to show what he could accomplish in a positive way. But w what's your sense of, uh, of not necessarily the relationship, but uh, uh, the significance of, of Elizabeth in, in his uh, later political career. I, I, I didn't know the Bob Dole prior to Elizabeth, so I, I really have no basis of comparison. I, I, th I would think that she had somewhat of a moderating influence on it. I think that if I had to guess, and it's just a guess, sure. there were two, two things that occurred in Bob's evolution as a United States Senator. One was the marriage to Elizabeth and the the degree of um, of, of sort of comfort and um, and strength that he drew from that relationship and her larger influence on his overall approach to things. And then secondly, I think he became far more an institution man than he was when he started. Um, he was, uh, he, the perception of Democrats of Bob Dole has changed dramatically in, in the last uh, 40 years. Uh, when he came to the Senate, he was viewed as a firebrand. He was viewed as a hardcore partisan. He was the chairman of his party. And, uh, and even up to including that time when he ran as the vice president, he was kind of viewed as as the attack dog. And um, But then something happened, and um, even though he was viewed in that way, and in my view rightfully so oftentimes, he, um, he became much more Bob Dole, the pragmatist, the deal maker, the the, the, the person comfortable in working with George McGovern on child nutrition and uh, with Tom Harkin on on the Americans with Disabilities Act. I mean, monumental pieces of legislation that could have never occurred were it not for the fact that uh, somebody with his Republican credentials could come together with someone with equally as strong Democratic credentials and fashion this remarkable compromise legislatively. And I think he got so much fulfillment from those accomplishments that it probably led him to understand that if these were 
were good things, that there's a lot more that could be done in that regard. And so by the time he and I developed our relationship, he had well understood and acquired that feeling. And so I was the beneficiary of that evolution. And I, I, uh, I think it's true today. I've heard, actually heard him say in, in um, speeches around the country that uh, uh, some of his proudest accomplishments were ones where he worked across the aisle with others uh, who were not of his philosophy or of his his political uh, persuasion. So, um, but I think that's really, uh, that happened in the, you know, about halfway or two-thirds of the way through his career. And now he's viewed by virtually every Democrat as a pragmatic, moderate, who um, people would jump at the chance to work with at almost anything he wanted to do. And ironically, for that very reason, is pilloried by many in his own party, exactly. particularly on the right, exactly. for whom consensus is a dirty word and compromise is equated with surrender. Exactly. Tell me about the McGovern relationship, because that really does encapsulate all of this. And it still surprises people that, uh, who don't know that, that the two of them are, are such close friends. Well, Bob, of course, was the chair uh, of, of the party when George McGovern ran for office. And so they were, uh, when it, I should say, when he ran for president. And uh, so they couldn't have been more diametrically uh, opposed to politically and ideologically and style and everything. I mean, uh, so it was, it was really... Uh, uh, a classic political case of strange bedfellows. But they both served on the Agriculture Committee and they both, uh, I think over time, realized that the only way they're going to get something done, because by then we had seen the diminution of democratic strength within the, within the ranks of the Senate, and so there was a requirement that they start working, that we find these odd relationships. and. From time to time, they, they start to develop. And I think it was just, it started with agriculture, and it started with this belief that not only could they work out wheat agreements together, maybe they could actually work out nutrition agreements together. And and I, I to this day, I can't tell you who was more the force of, 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 uh, of the effort. I mean, they both care so passionately about this. But over time, because they worked so closely together, they developed this friendship. And uh, the friendship led to a relationship that to this day is one that George McGovern holds to be one of the most special in his life. Uh, I was just... Uh, fortunate enough to attend the dedication of the McGovern Library in South Dakota, and uh, uh, Bob Dole was there, and uh, and I was uh, I was surprised at the at the depth of public affection they showed towards each other, and uh, it was really kind of an emotional experience to see it and to. Uh, understand how these two old political warriors are now the closest of friends and care deeply. I ever, Almost every time I see Bob now, one of his first questions is, how's George doing now that Eleanor died? Mm. And so Eleanor, George McGovern's wife. So um, they, they, uh, they found a moment that transcended politics and ideology and that uh, has created a friendship that lasts uh, and is very deep to this day. And I wonder too, if, to go back to the earlier point, they're both populists. I mean, there's both there's that streak of rural populism and, and real compassion for people who are, who are life's victims. When I think, you know, they're both about the same age. Um, the and war George, experience. The war experience uh, also. George was a very um, able and heroic pilot. I think he flew something like, I don't know, 25 missions or something. May have been more than that. Uh, at the age of 19 and 20 years old as a pilot. Um, it's a horror stories about landing aircraft with so many, with a bullet-ridden airplane. And uh, so I think they both showed remarkable valor and courage in time of war. And so they had that wartime experience. But I think with age too, and I, 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 I don't know if this is categorically true, but, but I think with age you became you become 
more appreciative of what is really important in life. And some of the things that seem important when you're 40 aren't nearly as important when you're 70. Isn't that right? It's easier to be a statesman the older you get. I think so. If your name isn't on the ballot. I think so. I even find that when you're, when you're not in office, somehow the, the uh, you know, these battles don't take on the meaning that they had when you were in office. Um, I, I've had countless, uh, very, very friendly relations with, with some of the people that, uh, that uh, I had huge legislative battles with in the Senate. But, but, uh, but times change and your attitude changes. And, uh, but I think it is true that once you depart from the Senate or the Congress, uh, um, for whatever reason, these fights don't quite seem to have the same depth of consequence that they might have had otherwise. I, I became very close to uh, President and Mrs. Ford in their later years, and I will always be grateful for the uh, Congressional Gold Medal Ceremony, and you've said some very nice things that day, uh, which I know touched them deeply. But I mean, there is that sense that, you know, why, why do you have to wait till you're 80? Right. You know, to... Right. Well, you see that with them. I mean, you saw that with President Ford and President Carter, yeah. two opponents. Um, you saw it with President Bush now, uh, first President Bush, 41, yeah. and President C and Clinton, uh, two opponents. I mean, it just, uh, it really, something happens, but uh, yeah. A couple quick things that I want you to go. What, what is it about being a senator that in some ways, particularly in the modern media age, doesn't necessarily disqualify you from the presidency, but, but makes it an uphill struggle. I mean, famously, only two 20th century presidents have gone directly from the Senate to the White House. And oddly enough, in some ways, it's almost the more successful you are as a legislator, uh, the harder it is to translate that into whatever it is people are looking for in, in the modern mm -hmm. executive. Why, why do you think that is? I think it's three things. First of all, I think that it's um, hard for somebody who has been entrenched in public life to advocate change because you're not very credible advocating change when you've been part of the establishment for as long as you have been. And most presidential elections seem to be about change to a certain extent. Certainly the elections would with which I'm most familiar. If, I mean, that's people have wanted to move in a different direction, and uh, 2000 may not have been that necessarily, but uh, certainly to a certain extent, from a personal, I, I think that that was sort of a reflection on. They, they, I think the American people liked the policy. They probably didn't like the deportment, and uh, but change has always been a part. And I think uh, once you become part of the establishment, it's harder to advocate from a credibility point of view that uh, you you're an agent of change. The second thing that I think is unfortunate because it's it's turned logic on its head in many respects, and that is experience is not viewed as an asset um, in the presidency. People want fresh faces. People want, um, they want to think that, uh, that somebody who can be an agent of change can also uh, um, not be a part of the, the process. And unfortunately, um, our legislators uh, have been part of a process that the American people in large numbers haven't appreciated. I mean, the numbers in Congress today are quite low, around 27% approval rating, even lower than President Bush, in part because I think the perception is nothing gets done. So you start with this sense that if you've been part of that process for the last 20 years, uh, where nothing has gotten done, uh, how is it that you could possibly lead us now uh, and get something done? The final thing is that I think legislators all too often become victims of their own rhetoric and 
they speak in legislative ease. And, you know, I'll never forget Al Gore talking about the Dingle Bill as evidence of his, the strength of his conviction in support of health care. Well, nobody had a clue what the Dingle Bill was, but that's what we do as legislators. It's shorthand. We rarely use numbers. Once in a while you'll use a bill number, but it's mostly a, you know, you, you talk in bill and amendment jargon that, that is a major disconnect with the American people, uh, where those who haven't had to, to, to talk in acronyms and in, and in uh, sponsor names um, uh, are far more able to talk about a grander vision rather than all the muckety-muck of legislative ease that so plagues our language as legislatives, legislators talk with one another. You have talked about Dole's last speech on the floor of the Senate and uh, the fact that he was urged to uh, really make it a campaign speech to bring in wedge issues and the like and that he resisted that uh, advice. What, what's your recollection of that? Well, to be honest, I don't know if I have a lot of recollection. I do, I, 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 I could recall that, that right from the beginning, um, when Bob told me he was going to run, he said, look, I'm going to run, and that's going to be my kind of campaign. Yeah, and he, sort of a, an oblique reference to others in the party that wanted him to run in a way that was more in keeping with what they viewed to be the new success uh, for a strategy for the Republicans, that, that they wanted to run this fireland ideological contract with America approach to politics. And, and I remember Bob fairly clearly saying to me, um, you know, that's not who I am. And um, so I'm going to run a race that at the end of the day, win or lose, I'm going to be proud of. And, and I respected him a great deal for that. I mean, he was critical of the Clinton administration for all the reasons that he believed they were on the wrong course, but uh, but it wasn't the kind of ideological Gingrich approach to politics that uh, Bob never felt comfortable participating in. But it's funny because I, I went back, I looked in that last speech, among other things, he talked about working with George McGovern, he talked about working with Hubert Humphrey, Right. talked about working with across the aisle, and, and you had a sense that's the kind of president he would no like question. to have been. No question. He would have been a great president. I, I, I have no doubt that Bob Dole would have been a president that I would have truly enjoyed working with simply because of his his newfound approach, not necessarily newfound, but, be, but because of the evolution of the Bob Dole that I knew when he left the Senate. Uh, Bob Dole was no longer the firebrand uh, bomb thrower and uh, attack dog that he was perceived to be 15 years ago. He was now a statesman, and he was a person who was proud of his achievements, proud of his, his time in the Senate, proud of the fact that he protected the institution, and uh, and uh, I think he would have been every bit as effective uh, a president as he was a majority leader. In foreign policy, Kosovo and Bosnia had, were, were clearly significant issues at that point. Um, and where did he factor in? Well, well he was... I, I'm not, I'm, I don't have the... I, I'd have to go back. If I recall, he, he was fairly reluctant to, to support what the president was trying to do in Bosnia and Kosovo. He thought that it, you know, he was asking some of the questions I wish I'd have asked about Iraq um, that I didn't ask. Um, circumstances, of course, were different. It was pre-9-11, but nonetheless, um, he was asking questions that I think the minority should have a right to ask and should be expected will ask as we Consider, consider intervention abroad. So, uh, but he was not very supportive of those efforts, and and they turned out to be um, uh, reasonably successful. But but uh, but his questions were appropriate, and uh, and I don't think anyone ever questioned whether or not he r raised them for for the right reasons. Do you think he could have done anything differently in '96 that would have affected the outcome of that election? I don't think so. I, you know, he. I remember he spent uh, those final, what was it, 24 or 36 hours uh, 
nonstop because he felt that he was closing that gap. It uh, it ultimately didn't turn out that way, but I uh, I think I think that uh, President Clinton is one of those rare people in politics that. Uh, that is an extraordinarily able politician, regardless of one, how one views uh, uh, other aspects of his career or life, but, uh, but no one can take away the extraordinary ability he has as a political uh, candidate. And, uh, and I think uh, given the fact that our economy was rebounding, things were as strong as they were at the time, it was uh, an uphill battle for anybody, Bob Dole included. How, presumably, was he a factor at all? You're winding up here. I mean, he tell was. me about the relationship since he's been well since you both been out of the Senate. Yeah. No, after I, uh, uh, as I was making my plans uh, post Senate life or post Senate life, uh, he called me one day and asked if we could come by. And I joke with audiences that uh, at the time he was a. Uh, spokesman for Viagra, and I was wondering if this was going to be a sales call, <laughs> but um, but nonetheless, uh, he came by to talk about the fact that he had joined a firm about a year earlier, and liked it a lot, and that they were hoping to have a Republican and a Democratic leader in the same firm, and and uh, so uh, this would be something that uh, that he would be very interested in pursuing with me if I wanted to. Th think about it a little bit and so we talked a couple more times about it but he was very uh, uh, extremely uh, uh, encouraging and welcoming and supportive of my effort to come to the firm and uh, and that's the way he's been ever since I've been here we've worked on many projects together in fact next week we're going to be releasing the 21st century agricultural project report that we've been working on for almost two years and we're very excited about it. I think it'll be reasonably newsworthy. And um, but uh, but he's been a, a true friend and a great partner. You both had the experience of sort of abruptly leaving the Senate. Is there a period right after that, a period of adjustment, or when you wonder if there is life after the Senate? Oh, or? totally. Yeah, absolutely. It's not. It's you know. It's kind of like. Uh, uh, I can recall uh, whether you're skiing or skating or, or uh, you know anything. You, you uh, if you've been doing it for a while or, or running a marathon like I've done a couple of times, they just when you when you're doing anything for a long period of time, then you stop doing it. You want to keep doing it. Well, that's been my experience in public life. I've been in public life for so long that you just feel totally like. Uh, the fish out of water uh, you hear about it's just it's it's truly a, a, a you know a shock to the system initially uh, because you're used to you're used to the life as as you've adapted to it for for so long and uh, I think for him uh, he knew exactly what he needed to do for those for that year whatever length of time it was and running for the presidency so he was completely absorbed into his new role but I'm sure after that he had the same effect the same experience I did so his was delayed for a little while but it, but after you've after the election um, there he was he, he had he had to decide what he's going to do with the rest of his life and so for a while you're you're just trying to adapt and trying to figure out, you know, how do I put the pieces together? And I'm sure, like, uh, in many respects, we probably looked at it much the same way. We talked to a lot of people. You know, what what advice would you have? How do you how do you do this? And and uh, you know, if you work at it, eventually you find the right formula, and it works out just fine. Do you recall? Did you ever have a conversation with him? I did. Oh, about, many about, times. About Absolutely. This you bet. Yeah. yeah. Finally, how do you think he should be remembered? Oh, I think he should be remembered in um, many different ways. First, as a person who sacrificed a lot for his country uh, physically and who never forgot uh, the commitment made to veterans. He was the chairman of the World War II Memorial and I know as he considers his life that accomplishment is something that he holds to be very special. 
So you start with that. You start with this kid from Kansas who, living on the plains, uh, developed an appreciation for his country and his community. And that, I'm sure, made the indelible mark on his character that we see in Bob Dole today. You see him as a hard-charging political leader for a long period of time who evolved into a hard-charging national statesman who cared deeply for accomplishment, who was not afraid to endure the criticism of people in his own party, oftentimes to do the right thing, reaching across the aisle, even to a period after his time in the Senate uh, where he reached towards me. So I believe that uh, history is going, to, is going to reflect very well on the career of Bob Dole. In some ways, time's been good to him, hasn't it? I mean, everyone will, sure, if you run for president, you'd like to win. But if you don't win, not bad to have had the life that Dole's had since 96. Oh, he's had a great life. I don't know how. I mean, win and lose. I, I don't think life ought to be nothing but a succession of wins. It's easy for me to say that because I've been very lucky in life too, but I've had some some losses that have had a profound effect on my life. And, uh, you know, I think you put together the the columns of wins and losses for Bob Dole, and the wins exceed the losses dramatically, uh, but you can't minimize the losses, like his physical loss and his his loss of his presidential campaign, but uh, all in all, if you look back and it's like somebody designed it, and, uh, and he's had a, an incredible life, and I don't think he'd change much of it. Listen, thank you. That My pleasure. Cannot, a, can't thank you enough. Good, good.